Welcome to the Fort Pitt Capital Group webinar series. I am absolutely delighted today to have the opportunity to discuss something that applies to so many of our clients and so many of the people we deal with. Namely, how do you deal with stress? And boy, do we have a ton of stress going on right now, not just in terms of life and the situations that have been occurring over the last couple of years, but even just this morning. So it's, it's quite a bit, uh, quite a stressful environment. And anything that we can use or employ that will help us to combat or mitigate the effects of stress is really valuable. So I have with me today, Laura Zervos. Laura Zervos is a longtime friend, an expert in this area, a registered dietitian, a licensed nutritionist, and works especially well with high performing individuals, people who are dealing with stress, whether as a result of their business, their life, their circumstances, and it is a real privilege to introduce Laura to you today. I think you're gonna love this, this uh, discussion. And we certainly welcome any questions you might have. So to give you a little bit of background before I turn it over to Laura, um, just to give you a little notion about Fort Pitt Capital Group for those of you that aren't familiar with it. We've been around for 27 years, manage over $5 billion providing customized uh, investment and financial advice, uh, always in-house decisions and as you can see, a fiduciary approach. We use a fiduciary approach because we take the responsibility of putting your interests first seriously at all times. Um, we work with a very close, personal, and uh, attentive uh, manner, making sure to provide coordinated financial advice across your entire spectrum, whether it's with the company in a 401k, whether it's helping you to exit a business, or it happens to be, you know, more importantly, making sure all of your assets work together so you can realize your financial dreams. We take a holistic approach and we're completely transparent about everything we do. So just to kind of give you a quick notion, we are a resource. We want to make sure we're not just financial advisors. We get to know and we care about, candidly, we love our clients. And we want to make sure that we give them the best opportunity to have their very best life. So we tackle lots of questions that affect or uh, have impact on their financial stability. And that means we bring together a, a wide range of professionals. Typically, we work in concert, close connection with healthcare professionals, lawyers, CPAs, uh, anyone who can make, help make the benefits of what we do better for you, but also anything we can do to help our clients. And that's one of the great privileges of working with Laura today. So I've been doing this for many, many years. Um, many of you have already seen me before. I'm a certified exit planner, which means I work with business owners in particular to help them transition to their next life, uh, which would be life after the business, or maybe it's on to the next business. But more importantly, we bring together a complete array of financial skills and expertise to make sure you make the very most of your assets. That's the key, that's our goal. So how are you gonna interact today? Well, you will notice if you take a look at the bottom of your screen, you see where the little arrow is pointing out, we've got some handouts for you. And those handouts, they're gonna be valuable. Laura has a lot that she's got to offer you today. If you have a question, you can just click on that as well. If uh, you're on your desktop, you'll find it right up there. And likewise, uh, there'll be a little tab that shows handouts, as you can see there in questions. There's a little pull down. So make sure you take advantage of that during the webinar. I wanna just kind of discuss, and you already see we've kind of jumped into this, the brain. So what we're gonna be talking about talks, touches directly on the issues of the brain because that's the source of stress. So what we're looking at when we're dealing with stress is we're invariably talking about what impacts the brain and it warrants a quick look. So typically the common focus right now is to sort of split it into two particular areas. You've got the prefrontal cortex, which is called the executive function, the C system, system two, critical thinking, call it what you will, people have various names for it, and the limbic system, which is more of a survival mechanism. This is probably the oldest part of the brain, it is. It's, some people call it the lizard brain, the X system, system one, intuitive thinking. If you were to kind of describe the difference between the two, the limbic system is ancient, remarkably efficient. It's really been purified and perfected over millennia. It takes care of the autonomic processes of your body. And it's a source of what we often think of as gut reactions. It's remarkably efficient. I always tell folks, listen to your gut reactions. Your gut reactions are accurate. It just takes a while to unpack them. You certainly experience this system whenever you have a compelling urge to do something, whether it's eat or drink or sleep, fight or flight. 
that becomes particularly important for those of us in the financial industry when we're dealing with times of crisis because that's when that tends to override it's incredibly powerful uh it is powerful and at moments it can feel like if you feel like you've got an ex experience anything that feels like a threat to survival your cortisol just takes off you know and it's, it's a whole hormonal system everything kicks in all non-essential or secondary systems are basically shut down and the senses everything are heightened all of this is the limbic system overriding everything else to make sure you survive but it has an incredible consequence now in the short term it's phenomenal it gears everything for immediate survival long term that kind of stress is remarkably corrosive and that's one of the things that laura and i are going to kind of work through today actually laura is uh, help us get some insight into how to kind of manage some of those things but before we delve into that in some depth i just want to give you a little bit more background Obviously, it's as I said, it's an older system and it really overrides this much younger sibling, which is the prefrontal cortex. This developed much, much later. It's kind of a bit buggy as a result. It doesn't always coordinate well. Um, and because the limbic system is so powerful and helps to develop these wonderful things like habits, we can develop unproductive or frankly, unhelpful habits. Coping mechanisms, it can lead to self-medication, it can lead to all sorts of things which result in us choosing short-term ends over more rewarding long-term goals. So think of it that way. If we take a look at it, the ancients would oftentimes look at this, uh, Plato in particular, I mean, people have been dealing with these, these issues of these two competing systems for a long time. From the early philosophical thought, would focus on it, and, and Plato expressed it, as I mentioned, um, in, in terms of a chariot and the horses. Um, it's a good metaphor. The horses are kind of the limbic system. The chariot is the uh, prefrontal cortex. Um, Dr. Jonathan Haidt, who's done some wonderful work recently on this, uh, says, no, it's not really two horses and a charioteer. The brain doesn't have reins. It's much more like an elephant and a rider. Uh, the elephant, the rider can coax the elephant, it can nudge it, but it can really only guide the elephant when the elephant is docile. And if it's not, well, that's when things get really interesting, really interesting. In particular, this tends to happen when we experience something called loss aversion. Uh, studies show that people fear loss much more than they value gain, and for good reason. You got to remember that we and we do tend to focus much more on the negative than on the positive. That's just true across the board. In fact, there's good reason, as I said, for, for why this occurs. Loss aversion is the result of a survival habit or response. You know, if you take a look at it historically, you know, in the early stages of evolution, uh, if you missed a meal, it wasn't the worst thing. So you miss something positive, not the worst thing, you'll find another meal. If you miss a predator, that was devastating because frankly, there was no second day. So consequently, one of the things that I mentioned that happens is the, the limbic system floods, overrides the prefrontal cortex. And in fact, that's what Dr. John Gottman, who does a lot of research on this as well, talks about. So when you experience panic or you experience something in a particularly heightened state, you're gonna experience something that is scientifically called flooding. Let's make sure. One of the issues of flooding is tunnel vision. That is, all of a sudden, everything gets focused on the one thing you need to do to escape, to succeed. It's one of the reasons why they talk about if you're in the middle of a fight or an argument and things get heightened, you need to step away. You need to de-escalate. Otherwise, the prefrontal cortex at this point simply isn't working. It's been overridden. The elephant has taken over. So if the elephant takes over, what can we do to help mitigate that response? How do you talk to the elephant? Well, there are basically three different things that you can do to help manage it. Whoops, let me go back here, I apologize. There are three different things that you can do to help manage the, uh, the elephant, three different proven ways, one of which is you want to take a moment, as I said, to de-escalate. Step away. You have to make sure that you get out of it. And one of the things Dr. Gottman talks about is you have to step away for a long enough time and think about something completely different. Anything that touches on it will reignite or re-trigger that experience. The second thing you can do is work on something called CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy. Look at how you're framing things because oftentimes the way we frame things can create unnecessary tension or can trigger 
hold unresolved PTSD. A third thing that you can do is prayer or meditation. What that basically does, the brain is remarkably plastic and it helps to connect stronger connections between the prefrontal cortex and the limbic system. So now you're more centered, more grounded, you are able to take on stresses more productively. That's why a lot of people do this early in the morning. Very helpful for the day. Another thing, of course, that you can do is Prozac, but that goes way beyond the point of this discussion. So at this point, I really wanna turn it over to Laura and allow her to detail great ways that we can help to manage and de-escalate the stress. So Laura, I'm gonna ask, um, here we go. Okay, thank you, Chris, for that introduction and, and for that uh, uh, great lead in. Um, so again, yes, I'm Laura Zervis. I'm a registered dietitian and licensed nutritionist. Uh, have, I have a practice that I see half of my clients are weight management clients. The other clients I help manage chronic disease um, through their diet and lifestyle modifications. So um, I actually started out in my education with culinary arts and I did work in the hotel and restaurant industry for quite some time and that was very stressful. And that's when I decided, hey, this isn't for me. Um, and I realized that I did like that nutrition course that I had in chef school and I changed gears. Um, but that culinary experience has really helped me help my patients um, not only give them uh, good advice, but then also practical advice in the kitchen, how to modify recipes, how to do different things. So um, we'll get to more of that later. Uh, we're gonna talk about stress today. I do know that some of you have submitted questions. Some of those are going to be answered um, during the, the presentation. If you have anything specific, you could always reach out to me individually. All my contact information is there. Um, so let's get started talking about stress, what, what Chris has uh, told us about. Uh, we're going to talk about how we could combat stress too. Um, and, and stress is a good thing at times, right? It helps us get ready for that presentation. It helps us get ready to do those difficult things. Uh, all the hormones start kicking in. Um, and what happens during that stress is a, a whole cascade of hormonal events that's called the HPA axis or the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. And it's a wonderful intricate system it starts in the hypothalamus um, once we are in that stress. And this, this happens so quickly. Uh, we think that we, um, that's how we are able to do things in a stressful event, like lift a car off of somebody. These things just kick into gear so quickly, we don't even realize it. But anyhow, um, that once those adrenals are stimulated and um, cortisol is produced, Cortisol will stay in our system. It'll stay high for a little bit of time. And then through homeostasis, eventually it will get back to normal. Um, and that's, that's in acute situations. And usually, um, usually like that's resolved in a short time. But after repeated exposure to stress, the hypothalamus and the pituitary are less sensitive um, to this negative feedback system and those cortisol levels stay high. So let's see what happens during that time. So you could see on this, sli on this slide that the um, cortisol, when we have those higher levels, what it can lead to. Um, and it leads to um, a weakened immune system, anxiety, depression, and headache, um, gastrointestinal problems, digestive issues, high blood sugar, diabetes, um, high blood pressure, and other heart disease. So that's why it's so important that we deal with that chronic stress, that we don't ignore it, that we don't just keep pushing it down, right? If we keep pushing it down, it's going to rise back up. Um, so that's something that we want to address. Um, and, you know, when we have uh, certain autoimmune disorders like arthritis, fibromyalgia, lupus, psoriasis, rheumatoid arthritis, Hashimoto's disease, the that chronic state of inflammation can exacerbate those systems. So another reason to get that under control, the inflammation under control. And Chris had touched on this before, some stress management approaches. Um, meditation, mindfulness, and prayer is an excellent way. And, and like Chris said, you know, five minutes in the morning has shown to be um, the minimum that would be to see some really good results. Um, also yoga. Um, both of these reduce cortisol levels and reduce stress and inflammation. Uh, guided meditation 
is also important. Um, over here, we have, um, you know, taking time out from social media and electronics. Sometimes we see these things and, um, you know, we're looking at Facebook, we're saying, oh, well, so-and-so's kids just made the honor roll and they're captain of the swim team and maybe we feel like we're not measuring up. And so after that long day of work, when you already have stress at a high level, you're, you're comparing yourselves to others. Um, so it's important to connect with others, you know, real time, um, even if it's a Zoom call, even if it's a face-to-face, -face, um, spending time with each other, having a coffee, doing those type of things. Um, also journaling can help, uh, writing down your feelings, writing down your thoughts, writing down goals, things that are important to you, um, putting pen to paper it really helps and it really helps with self-reflection. And lastly is regular exercise. And that is really important and goes a long way with, for our wellness. And if we look at our next slide, um, you know, the American College of Sports Medicine recommends a minimum of 150 minutes of moderate intensity aerobic exercise per week, which works, to be, works out to be 30 minutes, five days a week. Um, and they also recommend strength training of the major muscle groups two times a week. So, you know, look at your current schedule or what you're doing now, your current exercise regimen. Um, how much am I getting now? And that 150 minutes is the minimum. It's, a, it's actually 150 to 300 minutes a week. So um, find ways to incorporate that exercise into your daily routine. Uh, morning is another great time to do that before the events of the day creep in. And um, how do we do that? You know, we set ourselves up, you may be setting those gym clothes out the night before, um, scheduling it on your planner, like an appointment with yourself, trying to really work that in. It goes a really long way. And, and finding something that you love to do, it doesn't necessarily have to be an hour in the gym. It could be, you know, time at the, at the local trail. It could be bike riding. It could be a lot of people are playing pickleball now, which is also very social. So those are all the really good things that we could do for exercise and reducing stress. Okay. So we know that there's probably some things that we could do to eat and to and for stress management, but what should we avoid? And some of the things that we should avoid um, are the toxins, and I, I like to call these anti-nutrients. Um, high fructose corn syrup trans fat, sat fat, caffeine, alcohol, and processed foods. And we'll see how they, how they come in later. But you know, sometimes when we're under stress or we have a stressful day, these are exactly the things that we reach for. So they're not doing anything except exacerbating the problem, making it worse. Um, so these are things that we really want to get away from. And what foods can actually help with stress? Well, there nothing. There's no magic bullet food. Nothing proven in a in a randomized clinical trial that um, helps stress. But what we can do is we know the B vitamins and antioxidants can help. We know that in an acute stressful situation, um, say after a long commute home, if, if there was a lot of traffic or you or you were waiting in line because of a car accident and you came home and you were very stressed. And um, we do know that a serving of carbohydrates can help. One serving of car carbohydrate, around 15 grams of carb, maybe a handful of pretzels, make sure it's a good carb, um, you know, any type of carrots, hummus, anything like that. It'll help boost serotonin in the short term. So it could buy you a little bit of time until you come down. It does have that calming effect on the brain. So that's one thing that we could do. Um, then we know that a good eating plan, it, it'll provide complex carbohydrates, B vitamins, antioxidants, omega-3 fatty acids, um, and low in processed foods. So on to my next slide. What is that? What does that look like? Well, that's the Mediterranean eating diet, uh, Mediterranean diet. I like to call it myself, I like to call it the Mediterranean eating plan or pattern because it's really about that seven day pattern, right? It's not any one food, it's not any one day. This is a lifestyle. So um, it's very important to um, you know, pay attention to these things. Um, and we see at the very bottom of this pyramid uh, that you see people interacting with each other, getting physical activity, spending time with their families, and in the middle you see them uh, sharing a meal together. And that brings me to something I get asked so many times in practice 
is it okay if I eat dinner at seven o'clock at night or so late at night? Isn't that bad for me? And I tell them, well, you know what? I eat dinner myself probably around seven or 7.30, but it's with my whole family. And it's spending that quality time together and being together and listening to about each other's day and exchanging stories and sharing our troubles in a nice, safe place, sharing that meal. It's very important versus eating on the run, eating at our desk, eating in a car, having somebody come home from school and eating their meal by themselves in front of a TV. Um, so it's very important. Uh, that's And isn't it funny or peculiar, I should say, that this is the base of the pyramid. It's, it's the biggest thing because we are faced with this um, eating um, three times a day, seven days a week at least. So that's very important. As we move up the pyramid, um, we see where the, the bulk of the foods are here. Um, the whole grains, the fruits, the vegetables, the good fats like olive oil. We also see here nuts, legumes, herbs, spices. Um, right now, the recommendation for vegetables is a combined, fruits and vegetables is a combined serving of five a day. So any combination of that is great. Um, again, that shouldn't come from like a fruit juice or a vegetable juice. We're talking whole. Um, fresh is even better. If you're going to use canned, if that's all you have access to, that'll work too. Um, but certainly um, fresh and whole is the best. And then we see, um, we say fish up here, fish, seafood, and shellfish. And the recommendation is two to three servings. Um, per week and trying to get that in. Again, um, canned is okay. You know, if you could get grilled fish, if you um, if you have to rely on a pack of tuna or a canned tuna or um, a package of salmon, that's okay. As long as you're getting it in there. Um, the fish is so high in the omega-3 fatty acids and that is exactly what the American diet is low in. Uh, we're higher in the actual the omega-6 fatty acids that come from fast food and from processed food. So this is a really good source of those. Uh, the omega-3s, we're going to hit on it later. Excellent for cardiovascular health, excellent for brain health. Um, so try to get that in as often as you can. If you are not great at preparing it, it should be your go-to when you go out because you don't have to worry about procuring it. You don't have to worry about storing it. You don't have to worry about making it right. Um, if somebody in your family doesn't like fish, maybe you don't wanna make it home because of the way it smells. So maybe that's something that you get when you go out, uh, make that your go-to, just ways to sneak that in there. And then poultry and um, eggs and dairy are also part of the Mediterranean diet. Um, you see them less often. Uh, less than fish. And then we see that the dairy is actually the fermented type yogurts and certain cheeses. So um, that would be there. And then at the top, we have um, red meats, sweets, um, processed foods, you know, very, very minimal. And, you know, we could have the, if we do choose to have some of these things, maybe the red meat, you know, we could have it less often. We could put it in meats. Uh, we could put it in stews or soups rather. It's not the star of the show. It's not this huge portion of meat that we're consuming. So you could um, decrease the frequency and you could also decrease the portion size. Those are two good ways to look at that. Um, as we come down the side of the pyramid, we also see that we should drink lots of water every day. And if we do drink alcohol, um, wine is preferred over hard alcohol and other alcohols. And um, it's also recommended, while it is recommended that we do those things, we should do those in moderation. And right now, the definition of moderation for men is two drinks a day, and for women, that's one drink a day. Um, let's see, as we go on here. So let's talk about if we are following this um, plan, what we will. Um, get. We had mentioned that it would be high in fiber, high in um, omega-3 fatty acids, low in saturated fat, low in sodium. So the recommendation for fiber is 25 to 35 grams per day. Um, for women, that's closer to 25. For men, it's 35. Not that men need more, it's just that number is really based that in general, women consume lower calories than men. So that's why there is that, um, that range there. What are good sources of fiber? Um, fruit family, apples, pears, avocados, berries. I mean, most fruit contains fiber, but these are probably the higher ones. Um, 
avocados are really great. They have, um, for example, a half of a half of an avocado, say for example, it provides 15 grams of carb, it probably has 14 grams of fiber. So they're a real, um, really good source of fiber there. And when you look at the vegetables, of course, the cruciferous vegetables, broccoli, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts. We also have green beans in there, whole grains, bread, cereals, brown rice, all good sources. Um, and then the pasta family, you know, whole grain pasta, red lentil, chickpea, edamame pasta, they're excellent sources of fiber. They have very little net carb. Um, so they're a really good choice. If, if you haven't tried them already, I really encourage you to do them. They've come a long way from, you know, even a decade ago as far as taste and texture. Also, we have sweet potatoes, baked white potatoes, um, and I just, baked white potatoes, I just put in baked because I didn't want um, to just say white potatoes and then French fries get in there as well. Um, and then we also have the legume, legume family, beans, peas, lentils, almonds, all excellent sources of um, fiber. And this is, uh, you'd be surprised, this is where many people fall short in their, um, in their intake and meeting this requirement. Okay, next we have the um, omega fatty, the omega-3 fatty acids, EPA, DHA, and also LA, ALA. The recommended daily amount is 250, let me move this here, 250 to 500 milligrams a day. The best sources are, um, the animal sources are mackerel, tuna, salmon, herring, sardines, even cod. So a lot of people, um, Many people in, in this area in Western Pennsylvania, I don't think eat as much mackerel, maybe in herring. Um, it is available, it is available to us, but it's not one of those fish that you see too often, but cod is certainly everywhere. Um, and these are all good sources. Uh, when you look at the plant sources, I would say flax seeds, hemp seeds, chia seeds, soybeans, um, and vegetables, Brussels and scale, uh, kale get a small amount too. Um, a big one that is not on here is walnuts. Walnuts are the, the biggest um, omega-3 fatty acids out of the nut family. I believe one ounce of those contains 2,500 milligrams of the omega-3 fatty acids. Same with hemp seeds and flax seeds. All you have to have is a tablespoon of them per day and to get that requirement in. And um, let's see. So we have here, eat more fish, you know, two to three servings a week. And talking about saturated fat and the diet is low in the saturated fat. Whoops, sorry about that. It's low in the saturated fat because red meat is limited, full fat dairy products are limited. So um, this is where we find sat fat. And in chicken comprise no more than seven to 10% of our total calories. Fat in general should be about 30% of our calories or less. If you have active heart disease, I would say, or you know, high cholesterol, hypertension, anything like that, we're looking around 7% fat in your diet of sat fat and 10 if you are not having any issues. And I get that question all the time. How do I know if, if it's saturated fat? And I always say, well, you know, if you make something like um, pork chops or lamb chops and you have them on a serving platter and after everybody's done eating and you see this white fat on the plate, that is sat fat. Sat fat is hard at room temperature. Um, another example of sat fat, you know, I have on here the butter, but also um, vegetable shortening. You know, it's, it's that white vegetable shortening. It's um, hydrogenated fat. That is one that is also not good for us. Um, we also get it from red meat, like I said, fatty cuts of lamb, pork, chicken, um, dark meat, actually poultry, and with the skin obviously has the most saturated fat. And then we look at the cured meats, um, sausage, bacon, luncheon meats, all high in saturated fat. I mean, there are some that you could choose if you read the label, but as a general rule of thumb, these are usually um, culprits. They contain up to um, let's, let's just talk about it. If you um, have a 1600 calories, if you're eating around 16 to 1800 calories a day, that might translate to be 16 or 17 grams of sat fat. 
and something like this would probably, you know, the sausage or bacon, we're probably looking at eight to 10 grams right there. So that could add up very quickly if you're making those kind of choices. And next to our sugar slide, um, what about sugar? This is a question that I get asked a lot. Um, and somebody had asked, I believe in one of the questions, will a healthy diet help with the sugar cravings? And it actually does. Um, the more sugar that we eat, the more we crave it. The more refined flour and processed foods we eat, the more we crave them. Um, right now, the American Heart Association recommends that we have no more than 100 calories a day um, from sugar, and that translates to be 25 grams. When in practice, I, I see most of my clients, I try to keep them under 50 grams because of the, the sugar that occurs in fruits. Um, you know, an apple, right? I would not want somebody not to eat an apple and you could very easily get 18 grams of fat right there in a large apple. So it's not that I would want somebody not to eat that. That's why I have an allowance. Same with fat, um, you know, back to the fat slide. If somebody's having um, uh, fish and they're getting their source of fat from salmon or they're getting their fat from avocado, it's okay if it's a little bit over that 30% value that we were talking about. Um, let's see. So when we're talking about vegetables, we want to choose a variety of vegetables. That way we get the most antioxidants, the most phytonutrients, those ones that clean up free radicals in our body and sweep them out. Um, so very important to eat, you know, all of the colors of the rainbow. Um, you could see here we have, you know, the beets, we have the purple, the, the Asian eggplant, the dark green, the yellow, the red, everything. And that variety is what keeps our, our gut healthy, right? And it, it also keeps our immune system functioning, which is very important in this whole inflammation process that we're talking about. And we were talking, if you remember on the food guide pyramid that we were looking at, the Mediterranean food guide pyramid, um, we were talking about having, you know, a serving of nuts per day. And what is a serving of nuts? And this is a really good place to practice mindfulness because how often we may open a bag of nuts or a can of nuts and just keep diving in, keep diving in. And really it's one quarter of a cup or the, the amount that fits in the, our hand, our fist here, um, when we close our hand. Um, it's not too much if you put it into a small sandwich bag, it's the very bottom, um, but it's, that's all we need to get all of those, um, the benefits. So again, you know, being physically active, enjoying our meals with others, um, you know, using and the other thing that is built into here as well is a low sodium plan. So we see that we're using <clears throat> seeds, herbs, spices to flavor foods. Um, you know, the fish, the poultry, the, um, the ones that are fermented dairy products, and then we have the meats and processed foods at the top. So what can I do today to help to, to start eating this way? What, you know, what can I do right now? And I would say, you know, look at home, look at your cupboard and look in your pantry and see what kind of fat you're using and switch them to olive oil, even avocado oil um, to get the most, um, the most omega-3 fatty acids and, um, you know, versus butter, versus saturated fat. I don't know how many people still use a lot of Crisco in their cooking or bacon fat, but those kind of things were, were more common um, decades ago. You know, eat nuts and olives for snacks. You know, make that your go-to instead of potato chips or processed foods. And here's where we get our little fact about the walnuts. They contain more um, ALA than any other nut, and that's an omega-3 fatty acid. Um, so that's only one ounce of them and you have met that requirement. So that's a good snack to have. And when we were talking about, um, you know, being mindfulness, these are some of the things we want to do, prepare for, is to maybe portion these things out ahead of time. Look at that, you know, weigh them out or put them in a cup and measure them in bags so you have a good go-to snack. Um, in addition, we could look at the bread that we're using and switch any white bread out to a whole grain bread with, without any added sugar. Um, you know, try recipes, you know, experiment with some of the grains, try recipes with bulgur, barley, farro, couscous, and pasta made from the whole grains, red lentils, edamame, and chickpeas to add more fiber. 
um, eat the th three servings of legumes per week. And um, that even includes peanuts. Uh, we have the beans, peas, lentils. Think of ways that you can get them into your eating plan now. And, you know, some of these things we have in our pantry. You know, a can of beans is easy to keep in the pantry. Um, so it's not, that's what's beautiful about this diet. It doesn't require us to go to specialty stores or to, um, you know, buy any ingredients that are that are rare or unusual. These are all things that are accessible than we have than we could get to. Um, choose to eat fish a couple of times a week. You know, order it when you go out. Certainly, you know, they've made tuna convenient in the package and salmon and some other things like that. Um, take advantage of that. Eat less red meat. You know, prepare it in smaller portions or in stews, stir fries, soups. Have it less frequently. Um, you know, maybe serve it with other things. Try to keep an eye on that. Uh, you could really reduce the amount of saturated fat in a recipe by just switching to turkey or, or seafood or shrimp or anything like that. And as far as alcoholic beverage goes, you know, you would want to choose wine, especially red wine, uh, red wine in place of other alcoholic beverages. And again, just choosing, you know, more fruits and, and vegetables. Uh, from the color of the rainbow here. Let's see. Okay, so I know we had some questions. Um, would we like to get started yeah. on those? Yeah, then thank we'll you. Get uh, my... Okay, sorry. No, keep it right there. That's perfect. Um, yeah, we had a number of questions. So, uh, what should somebody expect when they begin to adopt this approach? What should they expect in terms of changes, in terms of um, challenges? Sure. What, would you, what have you found? Right. Well, I find that every client is different, right? Um, sometimes I'm their last, their last hope before maybe a surgery or um, taking a medication. So um, I try to meet somebody where they are. Sometimes um, people may be, you know, they may have limited mobility. So maybe they're eating frozen meals. And we work from that. You know, I, I try to get everybody to the Mediterranean plan at some point, but we start small and we start where they are. So they could, ex they could expect that um, I will meet them where they are, work with what they're doing currently and try to get them, you know, as, and I found that out too. Okay, you know, they think that, that I'm going to say, okay, we've got to clean out your whole freezer. No, you know, it's, it's not possible. Or, you know, you have to cook these foods that I'm telling you. Um, and that, that's just really not feasible. You know, we all have those foods that we like to cook at home and it's great to try a new recipe, but to maybe try seven new recipes in a week would be very difficult. Um, so I really try to work with people where they are and move slowly. And I think that's the best for lasting change. Um, like I said, some people that have limited mobility, um, they may be having uh, frozen meals for lunch and dinner. And okay, so let's pair a salad with that, right? Let's let's add a vegetable to that. And then slowly, slowly, oh, I realized I could do this too. I realized I could make, you know, a couple of chicken breasts at one time. Um, so that change is really um, what's important and getting the, um, you know, the, the client to buy into that process and, and to go from there. Do you tend to find that they come with uh preset expectations, unrealistic expectations, or they're just, they just reached a point where they don't know what else to do. What's your experience? Um, as far as, yes, usually people think that I'm going to, you know, make them, yeah, usually everybody thinks that I'm going to have them clean out their cupboard of everything bad. And, and yes, that's a great idea, but we could, we could make change slowly. The preconceived notion is that, that they have to do everything at once, but it's a process. And it's good to do one thing at a time. Um, and, you know, it's good to, you know, just like, let's talk about meeting people where they are or about the process. The gentleman that was eating the Subway sandwiches that lost weight maybe a decade ago, right? Well, that was a change for him. What was he eating before that? Was he eating Domino's three times a day? Um, so, you know, he made that change. And then I'm sure after he made that change, he had to make more changes too after his body adjusted to that. So. Yeah. It, it could just be baby steps, um, and that sometimes what really works. That brings up another question, which is, you know, what's the biggest change? What's the biggest change that you typically, the clients typically see when they're working with you? What's the biggest change or the most immediate one? 
Uh, the most immediate one is is the change in the way they feel. Um, and that's usually when we do something like uh, decrease the sugar in their diet. And people with the autoimmune disorders notice this most often the quickest. Um, as soon as they decrease the sugar, as soon as they decrease the caffeine, they can see ver results very soon. Um, mm -hmm. They feel they, um, they have less pain, less inflammation in their joints. They have more mobility. Um, I also find that once people, um, and, and sugar seems to be the big one that we deal with most often, right? Um, so as soon as people cut out the soda, um, they have more clarity, they don't have brain fog. Mm. We, we rely more on food to fuel us versus caffeine and sugar. That's probably the biggest shift that I see most often. And, and people feel it, feel better right away, the, the clarity. Right. Absolutely can attest to that. Uh, the the uh... Clean fuel feels radically different than the artificial stuff. Absolutely. So a couple of questions have popped up here as we're talking. Uh, I, and I, I agree. One is asking, there have been a lot of good reports about coffee. I've read where uh, drinking coffee can actually extend the telomeres, which is the, you know, the DNA strands that help to repair. Um, but caffeine kind of works against that. Now, caffeine is on the, the hey, we want to avoid this list. Uh, rather than eliminate coffee, the question is, how many cups would you recommend? Or maybe, what about tea? Sure, yeah. I yeah. think as far as the coffee question, sure, I think the coffee definitely has a place. I think, you know, one to two cups a day, one to two cups a day. Uh, it's what I see the people that have the most problem are the people that have that, the never ending cup all day that might be having seven to eight cups and maybe displacing their appetite, maybe displacing their water intake. Um, mm -hmm. That's where I see the problem. But I. No, no harm in one to two cups a day. As far as tea, I think tea is an excellent choice, unsweetened tea. Um, green tea has some really um, wonderful effects on brain health, cardiovascular health, weight management. It also has the um, theanine, the green tea extract, also has a calming effect on us. So that is really a really good go-to when we're talking about stress and acute stress. And maybe when you get home after like, you know, maybe that hour in traffic or there was a car accident, when you get home, that, that could be a really good thing to have first to get into that calming state again. You know, I find that too um, often with, uh, I don't want to get off track here, but you know, sometimes moms of young children, like when the children go off to school and they're at home, you know, they need that something. Sometimes they want a snack. Sometimes if they have a green tea and they could relax a little bit, that, that really gets them through that, that stress period. That's great. Yeah. Um, one of the a question arose here that was actually mimics an experience of mine. I, when I travel, my work almost requires that I'm eating a lot at restaurants or eating prepared foods. And we have a lot of professionals who have to spend a lot of time where, you know, they don't really have the opportunity to have home cooked meals. They've got to pretty much rely on prepared or restaurant meals. You know, what, how do you mitigate that? How do you recommend dealing with that when you're pretty much limited to uh, uh, produced meals. Yeah, that's an excellent question. Um, you know, the fast food restaurants get a bad rap, but really um, most restaurants uh, we find that are 30% higher in calories, saturated fat and sodium um, across the board, even our better restaurants. So you do have to choose wisely. I, I always try to choose um, as plain and whole as possible, you know, um, a fish that has been simply grilled versus anything with extra sauce. I mean, and we all know this, you know, instead of extra sauces, getting the sauces on the side, try to um, maybe frequent places that provide the nutrition information. There's um, many places that have made a big effort to responsibly source their foods from non-GMO sources and that they provide the nutrition information. And that's a really good way to, um, you know, keep your calories in check, your sodium and everything else um, that they've had somebody looking. So sometimes the chains um, can actually, you know, the, the bigger chains can provide, um, not talking fast food, I'm talking like better level, but not fine dining. Sometimes they always have their um, nutrition information available to you. But again, um, try to choose wisely, choose, you know, the protein and the vegetables. The vegetables can be your carbohydrate, you know, um, choose chicken, fish, a salad, a vegetable, um, you know, prepared simply, um, watch the extra sauces, watch the bread basket, 
you know, and if it is, and, and this is where portion size comes in too, right? Because we're all about value and oh, for just, you know, when we are at the fast food establishments, you know, at just 25 cents more, you could increase by 300 calories, right? So you wanna be careful to avoid that. But getting your brain trained while you're at home to see what a portion size is, is so important. What is a serving size of pasta? How, how big is that? What's a serving size of meat look like? Of chicken, fish, steak, whatever. So when you do go to that restaurant and they put that huge steak in front of you, you know, draw a line, uh, you know, ask, ask for a to-go box if you have to, but just draw a line down the middle there and say, okay, this is, this is a portion and I should be satisfied after that amount. Um, this is a portion of um, pasta. You know, it, it's, it's not this, this mounded plate of pasta. It's probably one, one fourth or one third of that. So getting to recognize portion sizes when you're at home. So when you're out, you could make those rational decisions. Yeah, very helpful, thank you. Um, one question that arose here is kind of, I'm not directly related, but it goes back to your sugar, sugar question. And I've heard this too, is honey really a better alternative for the body than refined sugar? I'm sorry, Chris, I didn't hear your question. Yes, is honey really a better- I'm sorry, sugar? Chris, it... Oh, okay. Um, is honey, the question is, is honey a better source of sugar than, than white sugar? And I think honey is, um, I do think it is better. I still think it, you know, it's still a source of calories. It still is metabolized very quickly, um, but it's definitely better than refined sugar. So it is a good source to put on some of our other things, um, you know, cereal, oatmeal, things like that versus a white refined sugar. Yes, I do believe that. So one of the things I found when I'm trying to make change, any, any change, and I, I love that you've kind of touched on this, it, it's difficult because you fall into routines and habits and they seem to work until the consequences you know, become evident, you go, this is not working. But making real change is difficult. Uh, what what strategies do you recommend? How do you work with clients to overcome those those difficulties that, you know, we all encounter when we're trying to change something that's just been a lifelong pattern? Right, right. And that, that's a really good point. Um, because some of those things are a pattern and because of, you know, it could be the people that we live with too. Maybe that, you know, they're not ready to make the same change as we are. And I see that frequently. And I think that's, that's really part of what I offer too, because when somebody comes on board as a client, I really partner with them. So they do have a support system um, and to help them make that real change. And we, and, you know, maybe we have to put in some cognitive behavior, you, you mentioned it before the CBT, cognitive behavior um, uh, therapy to replace some of the stimuli, you know, that, that triggers their response with, with the food. So maybe we have to say, okay, I'm not going to eat in front of the television. I'm not going to eat in my car. I'm not going to eat here, you know, and on and on. I'm not going to do these, set some ground rules up. Okay, I'm going to sit here. I'm gonna enjoy myself. I'm gonna put my fork down between, um, between bites. I'm gonna take a sip of water. Those kind of things slow down. So removing some of those stimuli, um, really help and in providing providing the client with a strategy to deal with it you know and at the close of every session you know I, I ask my clients okay what barriers do you see that are going to prevent you from achieving your goal this next week you know I, well you know it's uh, May, you know, where May for me is like um, that time between Thanksgiving and Christmas for other people I have a lot of obligations anniversaries birthdays. If I eat cake at every single one of those events, I'm gonna feel uh, not so great in June. So, you know, how do we navigate some of those situations? How do we navigate social situations? You know, providing somebody, equipping somebody with some really good tools that they could put into place. So while they're in my office or while they're in their rational mind and they know these things, oh, when somebody asks me that, I'm just gonna say, no, thank you. You know, sometimes it's hard to say no to a, a parent or a grandparent um, when they offer you some of these things or you're in a social situation and everybody's drinking or everybody's having something and you don't wanna be the odd one out. You know, how do I navigate some of those things? So we work on some strategies to do that and just practice, practice. And, um, you know, progress is not linear. There's gonna be bumps in the road, it's life. Uh, it's not like quitting smoking, right? So you don't need cigarettes to live, but we have to make these decisions three times a day or more, seven days a week about what we're going to eat and, and how we're going to do that. So it sounds as you're talking as if it's not really the incidental indulgences that might get us, but rather the long-term pattern. And as long as the long-term pattern's in place, 
you can handle the occasional um, carb loading or <laughs> the indulgence. Yeah. Absolutely. It's all, a, it, and that's what I like about the Mediterranean eating plan, or I call it a pattern really, because it's really, you know, how we manifest here today is, is a mat, is all accumulation of all of our choices, right? Whether we exercise every day, whether we drink lots of water, whether we eat fresh fruits and vegetables. So when you have that seven day pattern, let's just like, I think uh, we discussed before, like a run, like a rolling average, right? Um, of, well, I always eat a high fiber. My fat's usually here. My calories are usually in check. So one day isn't really going to make or break you. Just like one day, just think of it that way too, like one day of, of hardcore exercise really isn't going to do much um, mm -hmm. for your fitness, you know, or your endurance, but that every day it will affect it. So yeah, it's, it's about your pattern. It really is. Yeah, one day of, of hardcore fitness will just hurt the next day. Yes, and I have a feeling one day of really intense dieting, or I hate to call it that, but you know, restructuring your diet right. uh, might be a bit of a shock to the system. I like your idea of the small steps because people can make really remarkable changes with just small incremental adjustments to their behaviors. And that can result in a whole new perspective that changes the way they do things. I, I especially love, you know, it was, it was funny as you're talking about, I'm thinking of pulling up to like a burger restaurant or a fast food restaurant. If somebody had said, hey, for a quarter, you can get an extra 300 calories, most of us would go, no. <laughs> right, right. So I love that you framed it that way. CBT right there. Yeah, That's and it. I like that you said frame it. Like I, I get that, um, that question frequently. I'm going on vacation. What am I going to do? Hey, it's all the way you frame it. Look at it as seven days that you don't have work. There's no reason for me to not to get my exercise in. There's no reason for me not to get some really good healthy meals in. Look at it as a spa vacation. Look at it as a getaway for your health. It's all the way we frame these things and the way we approach them. Um, and really we could, you know, there's a lot to work with there. Yeah, actually, as you're talking, I'm thinking through another if framing issue. It's like, we it just changing it from I have to, to I get to changes, a, makes a totally different. Absolutely tone to it. So, you know, obviously you're dealing with some folks who have some pretty serious issues. When you have somebody, and I would imagine you do, a, a lot of folks deal with chronic stress or PTSD or maybe clinical anxiety. Um, do you work with other professionals to sort of coordinate care? Do you, what do you do? How do you handle those more acute cases, situations? Right. So I, if I was seeing somebody like that, obviously there would be some other, you know, co-condition that they would be seeing seeing me for um so i wouldn't be seeing somebody necessarily for you know the anxiety or the ptsd but maybe that would be something they had in along to with diabetes or heart disease or something like that um, it depends if they're if they're in recovery if they have worked with a professional if they've worked with a counselor or psychi psychiatrist and they're in recovery and they're in a stage where um they um, don't need that you know, we'll continue to work on the other areas of their, their diet and their nutrition. Um, but yes, somebody that has, that has overwhelming anxiety or has, um, you know, difficulty with PTSD, certainly, um, because we wouldn't want to do anything to trigger anything like um, any issues there. And, you know, because some of my approaches um, might not be appropriate for them. You know, that, that might be, some of my approaches actually might be a trigger, right? If I had somebody that had anxiety, we wouldn't want them focusing, being hyper-focused on their food and their intake, right? Um, because it could, or, or somebody with a, an OCD type or, you know, restrictive behavior. Uh, great point, great point. So if somebody was to begin working with you, what does that process look like? What should they expect? Right. So, well, you could get to um, that we'll have a really close relationship. Well, when somebody comes on board, uh, that first, that initial consult, you know, what I do is I review your um, lab values, if you have any recent lab work, um, any medications, your past medical history. And then from there is the interview process. And that is me finding out everything about you from the time you wake up in the morning till the time you go to bed. Um, you know, what you eat, what your activity is like, um, and then you know, what your weekends are like, your frequency of dining out, how long is your commute, how do you sleep? You know, people are like, why do you care how I sleep? Well, because, you know, if you, if you, um, if you have a BMI over 30, 
and maybe you're a candidate for some type of uh, device to wear at nighttime because of sleep apnea, that could really affect your health, you know? Um, so there's so much more to it. So we get to know um, all about you and um, then we make a plan and then I monitor your progress. And I have um, an app that I usually have my clients get if they're appropriate for that. And they'll log their food and that gives me real um, on time, uh, real time, I should say, um, data of what they're doing, you know, when they're eating, what they're eating. And then I look at that average in, you know, seven days, um, whenever they come back for their next visit, we look at the metrics that are hitting. I look at, there's, there's certain ones that I look at, um, all the time. And then anything that's specific to that client, if they have, um, uh, if they have, so if they're a soda drinker or they're a, large wine drinker, anything like that, then I would monitor those things as well. And that provides me really um, with a lot of real good information to, um, to help them and to guide them in the process, you know, working on some of their numbers. And again, you know, providing, equipping them to make some change, navigate these situations. You know, um, some people that have a hundred pounds to lose, they're with me for over a year. You know, I have a lot of clients that have been with me for a couple of years, but they're making that steady progress. You know, that the year's going to go by, right? Um, whether you do something or not. So even a, a quarter too. Well, wonderful. Laura, thank you. This has been incredibly helpful, very insight, insightful. Uh, obviously, we'd love to have people reach out to you who felt like, hey, I could benefit from your services. I'd love to improve my life. Um, so don't hesitate to reach out to Laura. Uh, there should be some handouts that we will be including for your benefit along those lines. Um, and Laura, I think uh, if I have the screen here, do I have the screen yet? There we go. Thank you. Appreciate it. So one of the things I did want to offer to anybody who's here today, anybody, uh, one of the greatest sources of stress is not knowing how well your financials are structured. And in today's environment, oh my gosh, uh, boy, the calls and the concerns are not unreasonable. There's a lot going on in the world that can cause you a lot of distress to make sure that your finances are structured the way they should be so that you don't have to worry so that you can have the best life that you can have. I invite you, please don't hesitate. Complimentary investment portfolio evaluation. We're happy to do it. No obligation, no fee, just gives you a little bit of peace of mind. So we're delighted. We've got an upcoming couple of webinars that we'd love to share with you. Project planning, a little different than, again, our, our usual focus on the financial element. Project planning, how many of us don't need to do, don't need that for their lives? Uh, we all do. And then retirement planning do's and don'ts. That's a key key expertise for us. So we'd love to be able to have you participate for that. Uh, it's been an absolute pleasure. Please do not hesitate to reach out. Love to talk to you. And we will certainly make sure to share Laura's information with you as well. Do need to disclose, obviously, you know, we wanna make sure that you understand that we are registered with the SEC. All of this is subject to compliance requirements and whatnot, uh, but we always make sure to give you the very best. Everything's transparent. So Laura, I, I really want to thank you for today. This has been a wonderful experience. I will ask you one last question. Let me see if I can turn my screen over here. That doesn't really help. <laughs> there we go. That should be able to, sh it should be, uh, there we go. Uh, hopefully they're just seeing you at this point. Um, but what is the one or two things that we can take away from, from this discussion today? Oh, great question. Well, thanks for having me here today, Chris. It's been really nice. Um, one or two things that I would say, um, you know, reach out to a dietitian if you have any concerns. Um, we will not offer you the magic bullet or a quick fix, but, but we will equip you with the tools that you need to make lasting change. And we look at the whole person, right? When somebody comes to see me, whether they have diabetes, heart disease, or they want to lose weight, we look at everything and we'll, we'll get you on the path to wellness. And again, I use the, the diet or the plan that we're talking about today for everybody. It, it's really the best way to eat and just small, if you could just do one thing every day um, to improve your health, make notes of your change too, and note the way you feel. Um, like you're at the airport with the full body scan or notice how you feel at the beginning and then just go through like a review of systems. It's a, it's a really great, great way to stay um, on top of your wellness. I love it. Little changes, what people tend to, to, to uh, forget is little changes compounded over time have such an enormous benefit. If you change one thing, even every week, you're not going to be the same person a year from now. 
it's going to be radically different. So just think about that. You're going to be you're going to be here a year from now, Lord willing, when the crypto will rise. You're going to be here from now. For, so why not make one change a week? Why not do something that will really improve your situation, right. your life? Laura, thank you so much. It's thank you. Great. All right. Thanks. Have a great day. You too. Bye bye. Thank you.